Please join me on the top of page four for the prayer for purity, which comes from the covenant renewal service. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The scripture this day comes from the message translation. I have listed that there on page four for you to follow along. Hear now the word of the Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wild preaching a baptism of life change that leads to forgiveness of sins. People thronged to him from Judea and Jerusalem, and as they confessed their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River into a changed life. John wore a camel hair habit tied at the waist with a leather belt. He ate locust in wild field honey. As he preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stage hand, will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. The moment Jesus came out of the water, he saw the sky split open and God's Spirit looking like a dove coming down on him along with the spirit of voice. You are my son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. This is the word of God for you and me, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, and as you are, let us bow together for prayer. May your spirit, O God, stand between me and your people so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be shaped and formed by the presence of the Spirit, your Holy Spirit, to be good news for us. For this we pray in the name of Christ, in whose name we've gathered, in whose name we will depart to serve. And all of God's people did say, Amen. I can remember vividly the first meeting having been fully appointed for the first time as a pastor. I was associate pastor and director of youth ministries at First United Methodist Church of Louisville, and I was in my residency committee meeting, meaning that a newly appointed clergy and member of the conference would have a group of laity gathered around to help nurture us in that transition of leadership. Paul Sackett, who was a diaconal minister, some of you know what that is, he's now retired, but at that point in time was the choir director and also handled many other aspects of programmatic ministry. I did not know anybody, so Paul said, don't worry, I'll put your committee together for you. The meeting opened as such. A beautiful little lady at the end of the table, her name was Luella Baker. What I didn't know was that she was in the church I grew up in when I was, how should we say, proof of original sin. (laughs) She opened the meeting saying, this should be an interesting journey because I don't know how you got into ministry. You were a rotten kid. It turned out to be one of the most beautiful aspects of the journey as we looked at growth. In fact, I was the last one to touch Luella's life in a blessing as she had a massive heart attack and was transferred from the hospital in Louisville to Irving. And as she came from the ER to the ambulance to be transferred, Geneva Bratton, who was a nurse and friend, who was also on that committee, put her hand in the small of my back and she said, you know she loved you, you're her pastor, go pray for her. Semi-conscious, I just simply said a quick prayer as we walked along and then put the sign of the cross upon her forehead, the peace of God sustain you, the love of Christ be always with you. And the next time we talked about Geneva was at her funeral. You know, a lot happened between that time when those people who left such an indelible mark on my life that helped celebrate my movement into ministry and being the little kid that Luella loved to talk about wearing red cowboy boots, walking through the freezer section, at Safeway. Does that tell you how old I am? Huh? How many of you remember Safeway? Yeah. 
How many of you remember the freezers weren't always the doors you opened, but they were just at these big troughs with, you know, that's where I was troughing through. Uh, much has changed. But, you know, you know and I'm starting to draw a spiritual connection. I grew up walking in the freezer section at Safeway as a child, and I'm going to be dropping the hockey puck in two weeks on an ice rink. <laughs> See, God was preparing me all the way back then for that very moment. We talk about baptism. We have so many things that we really make assumptions on or don't, don't really understand. Uh, Jesus' baptism was not a Christian baptism. Jesus' baptism was his propelling into public ministry. The very nature of Christ being holy God and holy man, Jesus didn't need to be washed from any sinfulness. Today when people are baptized, they're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus' baptism was not a Christian baptism. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. People coming from the region and area of Judea, which would be between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. People coming from Jerusalem because this prophet was practicing a Jewish practice of ritual cleansing. The place we believe that that now is is actually in the Jordanian controlled area. It's uh, filled with a lot of tall reeds that in the midst of the aridness, the water runs through. It is strikingly similar to what you experience when you go out in the washouts in the canyon, in Paladar Canyon. You go from the arid, the rocky, and then when you hit those stream beds, you see cattails and trees and cottonwoods. People come to John. And as our Jewish brothers still do today, they place a high importance on the ritual cleansing. Even before meals, they still do. They'll wash their hands. People would come to John to be ritually cleansed. They would come confessing of their sin. Then they would be ritually cleansed in this immersion, this baptizio, this putting into the water, under the water, in preparation for the coming of Messiah. Everything we understand about Holy Communion and baptism, and those are our two sacraments in the United Methodist Church and in the Protestant traditions, baptism and Holy Communion, both of those grow from a Jewish understanding. When we gathered last week for Holy Communion, we gathered remembering that Jesus was celebrating the Seder meal at the Last Supper Passover. And he transformed its meaning to become the Lord's Supper, but it grew out of the Jewish practice. When we come to the waters of baptism, we grow out of the same place. But what makes us distinctive as United Methodist is what we celebrate in the waters of baptism is a belief that baptism is not about our decision, but about God's decision to love us. Our friends across Polk Street at the Baptist Church and the Church of Christ, the practice what is called a believer's baptism. Someone makes the profession of faith, and as an expression of obedience to that profession of faith, they are immersed. Now, as United Methodist, we practice a baptism that celebrates more of God reaching to us first, then we make the profession of faith. So to oversimplify the baptismal debate, we both expect a profession of faith and we use water. What's the big deal? I was talking with a Baptist friend and said, well, if I baptize somebody up to here, does it work? He said, no. I said, if I baptize somebody up to here, does it work? He said, no. I said, if I baptize somebody up to here, does it work? No. He said, you've got to get from all the way to the top of the head. And I said, as Methodists, that's where we start. <laughs> now, baptism does not get you into heaven any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Okay? Let's not confuse the practice with the relationship in faith. But for us, I'm Methodist partly because I grew up Methodist, but I'm Methodist by choice because as we place the emphasis for God's activity in baptism, we then are able to extend the sacrament to an infant. Now, baptizing an infant doesn't keep them out of the internal place of punishment. Okay? It doesn't keep them out of hell. That's not why we do that. We do it because it's a radical expression of God loving us first. First John. We love because God first loved us. And then we expect that person to grow and respond to that baptism. But what happens when you find someone who, because of their developmental issues, is not able to make a profession of faith? 
Do we withhold the sacrament of baptism or communion because people aren't able to comprehend it like we do? We simply, in our tradition, lean towards the side that this is an expression of God reaching to the person. And so it is that it's a very powerful thing to be a pastor who has not only the freedom, but the purposeful understanding that baptism is about God's activity reaching towards all people. As I told the kids, I baptize everything from an eight-day-old baby to an 87-year-old man in a wheelchair and everything in between. It's about God's activity, God reaching to us. Now, this was made most recent and just a little bit of a clarification. Christening is a practice of giving a Christian name and a baptism. And, well, there's some folks across the pond that made that pretty public not too long ago with a new child that they had born. We prefer simply to call it baptism. And what we come to remember today is God's claim on our life in the waters of our baptism, regardless of our age, whether we were young or whether we were old, baptism is God reaching to us. But sometimes we forget whose we are. We forget the waters of our baptism. In the liturgy of the United Methodist Hymnal, you can even look if you get bored and you can look at the very back or during the liturgy of the different table word and table services for Holy Communion, and you'll find little red words. They're called the rubrics. They're the directions for whoever is running the service, if you would. The service of baptismal renewal, the rubrics in red, says that whoever the celebrant is, whether it be a, a clergy or a bishop or a DS, they should take the waters, put their hand in the water, fling the water to the congregation and say, Remember your baptism and be thankful. And that's a powerful symbol, but all I got wet was the floor. And I think that one of the things that could help us in being more intimate in our relationship with Christ and understanding is remembering the waters of our baptism. So when you come at the end of the service, you're invited to come to one of three stations. You'll be invited to come and to either touch the waters but we also invite you to receive the sign of the cross upon your forehead and feel the waters of your baptism. Feel those words that echo not only for Christ, but for you. You are my beloved, my child, my daughter, my son. You are marked by my love. You are the pride of my life. Your friends, that is the substance of remembering our baptism. I'm just like you in so many ways. I know you like donuts, you just don't admit it. I get a chance to talk about it. I was baptized as an infant, I grew in the church. I made a profession of faith when I was in confirmation and that set me on a course of learning to respond to God. I believe it's important that we be able to touch a time when we respond to God's love, but to quote my friend Justin Tall, I hope God's not done saving me yet. And so I look at my journey of faith through our Wesleyan and Methodist heritage, and I look at a series of times when my life was converted. I was still a child of God. I made a profession of faith in Christ, but at times I wander, I come back, and I turn again to God. FCA retreat after my freshman year, mission trip after my junior year, and the list goes on of moments that were sacred, touching moments when I could say, I'm renewing my yes to God. God hadn't stopped hugging me. I just chose to turn and hug God back. And how did I get into this whole clergy thing? I was the president of FCA, I was the president of the youth group, and I was a third generation Methodist pastor. So everybody in church growing up at Floral Heights said, well, are you going to follow in your father's footsteps? Now, I don't have a real active conversion story in the sense that, you know, I really didn't wander in foreign lands and quander my parents' inheritance and return to eat with the pigs. Though if you ask my older sisters, they say there are similarities in my journey of faith. <laughs> Some people say, why are you in Amarillo, Bert? And I said, because my sister's in Plano in San Antonio, and the likelihood of them challenging any of my versions of history are unlikely. <laughs> 
I kind of knew God's love the whole way. I was nurtured. I was loved by the church. And I make decisions rightly all the time. Heavens no. I made bad decisions. made wrong decisions. But I felt God tugging at my heart. I chose to go a year of, of um, first year of college to uh, go to play college football. And I thought about coaching. Uh, don't get impressed. It was a non-scholarship Division three school. <laughs> Um, sounds really cool, but it was really mundane. In fact, I played at Austin College, whose mascot is the kangaroos. That alone should be the story of humility. <laughs> it just didn't really fill the void in my heart, so I transferred to Hendricks College. And I think that that distance gave me the opportunity to answer God's call in my life for ministry. The true answer for my call to ministry came on a rocky beach in Fano, Italy when we had toured with the Hendrix College Choir and we were on the east side and we arrived in Fano, Italy and my mother said, don't you dare sleep on that trip. You can sleep on the plane, see everything. So my roommate, Kevin Matthews and I asked at the front desk, what should we see? And in typical fashion, the person there at the front counter said, ah, have you seen the Italian sunrise over the Mediterranean? Huh? We got the best sunrise in the whole of the world. So we got a five o'clock wake up call and went out on this rocky beach, which I think is my affinity for rocks, as it was pure darkness. But you could feel the mist and you could hear the coarseness of the waves crashing on that steep rocky beach. And then as the horizon turned from pitch black to purple, I began to see silhouettes and I watched men fishing the old-fashioned way. If you come to my office, I have pictures both of the sunrise and of the men fishing because back then there was a camera that would fit in your pocket called the Kodak 110 Instamatic. <laughs> How many of you remember those? Oh, I wish I had a picture that had a higher JPEG resolution or pixelations, but I can touch it. It may be fuzzy. I can see it and I can remember that moment when I saw those men fishing. And I knew, I knew then, it was God's call to my life. It wasn't family business. It wasn't familiarity. It was God's call in my life. And when I got off the bus and came back, I looked at the woman who's now in the front row as my wife, and I said, I'm going to marry you, and I'm going into ministry. And Sean will tell you from that point, she basically has tied her rope on the back of my boat and skied in the wake ever since. <laughs> I couldn't have made that commitment to ministry. If I hadn't been nurtured by the church and given the opportunity to go back and remember the waters of my baptism. We call this the general ministry of the church. All persons baptized into the general ministry of the church. And those of us who are clergy are called representative ministers of the church. But the robe and the stole does not exempt us from touching and living the waters of our baptism. So when you come in a moment... You'll be invited. Kevin and Dixie will be towards the end of each of the kneeling rails. I'll be here in the middle. When I was in the Holy Land last year, I picked up water from the River Jordan. And uh, this has been lightly disinfected with Clorox. A couple of drops per bottle makes it clean. I've added water from the River Jordan to each of these bowls this day. So that as you come this day, you might feel some sense of connection to a God in the place in which Jesus was immersed in the waters. When you come, you can either put your hand forward and have the water and the cross in the shape of your hands. You can simply make a gesture that you'd like to sign the cross on your forehead. You may simply come forward and touch the waters. But know this, when you do so, remember the waters of your baptism and hear God's voice speaking these words. You are my daughter. You are my son. You are marked by my love, and you are the pride of my life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's people did say, Amen. Amen.